verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are God, or that you are in control, Lord, in spite of technical difficulties or things that come unexpected, Lord, you remain God. You remain the one holy, true God who controls our lives. So, Lord, as we worship you, as we pray to you this morning, Lord, help us, help us to encounter you in new ways through your Holy Spirit. Thank you for being the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Amen. So the first song we're going to be singing is called The Lion and the Lamb. The Lion and the Lamb. So I'll give you a minute to, uh, to find the, the lyrics.
waters, I will rise.
we sing this morning is I Speak <coughs> Jesus. Addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is free. I speak Jesus. I your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. The shadows burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety. Jesus 
peace within his presence I speak Jesus Let's just take a moment to lift up those who God brings to your heart right now it could be a family member it could be someone that you know it could be someone that you work with could be somebody who is sick, somebody who is in need of prayer. Let's just lift them up before the holy God. who are in need this morning, Lord, we lift up those who are sick, we lift up those who are downtrodden, who are discouraged, who are weak, Lord, would you heal, would you strengthen, would you bolster this morning for your glory, or not our own, but for your name, or do this through Christ's blood. Good morning, everyone. Please have a seat. All right, so this is how old school I am. I thought we actually had bulletins. It's been apparently years since we had bulletins, so this was texted to me. Welcome, welcome to KCPC. If this is your first time here, um, it's not normally this disjointed, so I apologize, but if you've been here, um, Pastor Che will be back next week. So again, my name is Phil Kim. Um, this says, welcome. Oh, we're supposed to pass the piece. We used to do this before the pandemic so just uh, pass the peace among us say hi to one another give give everybody a, a fist bump not everybody just the person next to you a fist bump and just say good morning awesome well i know we don't have the apostles creed up there so you're gonna have to cue that up um what else are we doing the uh the glory patry so let me get to announcements here. All right, announcements. Uh, young adult ministry. We have a family group Bible study. Uh, they meet every Friday. The location will be announced in the Facebook group chat. So if you're a new young adult and want to get involved, uh, please speak with any of our young adult leaders. College ministry every Wednesday. We are continuing Bible study as well as family group Every Saturday morning, there are morning prayer meetings. Um, agape ministry, we meet once a month. Our next Agape Bible study will be this Saturday, October 21st and uh, at 5 p.m., and that's at the church. And we will be starting a men's ministry soon. I think John Shin is leading that up, so be prepared for uh, an announcement. And... Um, a call to be involved if you are a man. All right, sounds appropriate. Let's see, no women in the men's group. Uh, all right. All right, guys. I'm never going to be asked to do this ever again, I promise. All right. So we are, at this point, we take the offering, right? Yeah, let's do that.
words in prayer. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for all the ways that you've blessed us as a church, as the members, Lord, as visitors. Lord, you have been abundant in your provision for us. Lord, this is just a small portion of what you've given to us. So we pray that you would bless this to further your kingdom. Amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to recite the Apostles' Creed. So I'll let you guys either... Oh, you have it memorized. Okay, very good. It's good. Let's, uh, let, let us join together in confessing our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Knowing that we've all sinned and fall short of God's glory, let us confess our sins to God together in silence. Friends, believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. In him we're forgiven. Amen. in prayer. Lord, thank you again for how you have blessed us, how you have provided for us. Lord, we are grateful. Lord, again, those we lift up those who are hurting, we lift up those who are in need of your provision, of your care, who among us is without needs. So, Lord, we pray that you would bless your, ch your church. Lord, we lift up those um, as the there are global conflicts, Lord, there are people dying in the midst of wars, or there are people dying in our country, Lord, unjustly. Lord, pray that your hand of mercy and justice would move swiftly, or that you would show your kindness and your grace, not only to us, but to those outside the walls of this church. Lord, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Now I'm going to invite Pastor Koch to share God's word. Good morning. My name is Sarah Koch. It's my great joy to be here to worship with you all. Uh, my day job is working as uh, the chaplain with the Visiting Nurses Hospice, but it's my great pleasure to be able to join you guys on this Sunday morning for worship. Thank you, everyone, for your warm welcome and your hospitality. I'm very glad to be here. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God, 
for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. How can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. But Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and of spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You're Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, what we, spe we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak to you of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes might have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is a Nigerian author named Chimamanga Ngozi Adichie. And in a TED talk that she did quite a few years ago now, she tells what she calls the danger of a single story. She talks about growing up in a middle-class Nigerian family with parents who worked white collar jobs in a home where they employed live-in domestic staff. And one year, a young man named Fide came to work in their house. And I'll read a little bit about uh, what Adiche recounts. She says, the only thing my mother told us about Fide was that his family was very poor. My mother sent yams and rice and our old clothes to his family. She said, people like Fide's family have nothing. So I felt enormous pity for Fide. Then, one Saturday, we went to Fide's visit, uh, village to visit, and his mother showed us this beautifully patterned basket she'd made of dyed raffia. I was startled. It had not occurred to me that people in his family could make something. All I had heard was about how poor they were, and so it had become impossible for me to see them as anything else. Their poverty was my single story of them. Years later, says Adiche, I thought about this when I left Nigeria to go to university in the United States. I was 19, and my American roommate was shocked by me. And she takes some time and she recounts these microaggressions that she experiences from her roommate, including such things as her roommate asking to listen to her music and then being surprised when it was Mariah Carey and her roommate assuming that Adiche didn't know how to use a stove. And Adiche continues, she says, what struck me was this. My roommate felt sorry, before me, sorry for me before she ever saw me. Her default position towards me as an African was patronizing. It was pity. My roommate had a single story about Africa, a single story of catastrophe, a single story where there was no possibility of Africans to be similar to her in any way, and no possibility of feelings more complex 
than pity, no possibility of connection as human equals. I think in this story, you can find the whole thing on TED Talk, I really recommend it. Um, in this story, Adichie puts it so simply and clearly, she says it is dangerous to have a single story about any people, about any group of people, because there's too much possibility in the world for that. In fact, by living this way, this single story way, we lose the opportunity to know each other, to connect with a person that God has made in their sacred wholeness. What's more significant, it is deeply hurtful when people assume that they know all it is to know about you based on one fact about where you are from or what you look like, and no person should ever have to bear the burden of another's willful ignorance. And I was reminded of this talk again today, or this week, um, when I read the story of Nicodemus. I think there's commonly, at least as I've heard it uh, growing up in the church, there's one story about Nicodemus. The story is that he was a Pharisee and he came to Jesus and he asked some good questions, but in the end he didn't really get it. At least that's the sense I've heard him spoken of. He's not a disciple. He is not really someone to be admired. He's sort of an interlocutor that Jesus uses to teach us. The thing that's important to care about here are these important words, these famous words that Jesus says, very truly, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born again. And perhaps most famous of all, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that everyone who believes in him shouldn't perish, but should have eternal life. Nicodemus is just a side character in this story, at least as we usually hear it. I think it's less commonly told, or maybe just I'm just not paying attention, but it was surprising to me to learn that Nicodemus shows up two more times in the Gospel of John. Later in chapter 8, when Jesus is facing harsh and dangerous scrutiny by the temple police and by the Pharisees, we read Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus before and was one of the Pharisees, asked, Our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing and finding out what they're doing, does it? So in this highly charged situation, Nicodemus speaks up in defense of Jesus. And Nicodemus encourages people to listen to Jesus. Nicodemus, who as we're told is this leader in his community, who would have understood just how tense of a situation Jesus was in and what the cost of standing up for him in this way might have been. This is the man who says, stop, listen. Our law does not judge. In fact, it compels us to listen. And Nicodemus shows up again. After Jesus had been crucified, he brings myrrh and spices to prepare his body for burial, along with Joseph of Arimathea. So in this moment, when Jesus, the promised savior, the hoped for Messiah, has died, when their hopes are crushed and their dreams are shattered, in that moment, Nicodemus is still coming to Jesus but this time to care for his body. And I think this complicates things a little bit. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's a teacher in his community, and he keeps coming back to Jesus. So is it really that he doesn't get it? Or is he, like a lot of people, maybe like some of us, drawn to something that we don't quite understand? drawn to something that maybe scares us, drawn to a God whose presence, whose words, whose actions have real impact? Is he drawn to Jesus who is at once challenging and accepting? 
at once peaceful and just, at once powerful and vulnerable. Maybe in Nicodemus we see an example of some stories that could be amplified in Christian circles about Judaism. And Nicodemus can help us point to that. Let's hear, hear these words again, he says, in chapter 8. He says, our law does not condemn. So he's a Pharisee. He's a teacher of the law, so he knows what he is talking about when he says that. In fact, it kind of echoes what we hear in the end of our passage today when Jesus says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in or order that the world might be saved through him. So there's this deep kinship between Nicodemus standing and saying our law does not condemn and Jesus the son of God saying I'm not here to condemn the world I know in my own life in the church I've heard many times the saying that in the Old Testament God is harsh and violent in the New Testament God is loving and kind and that doesn't really add up with this story today Nicodemus and his desire to know and to understand what God is doing in the world, he cites the law, the Old Testament law, as a reason to hear Jesus out. He shows us live in action what Jesus teaches when he's in the temple. Jesus says the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And that's a direct quote from Deuteronomy, chapter 6. And Jesus continues, you should love your neighbor as yourself. And that's a direct quote from Leviticus 19.18. The story I know about Leviticus is that it's kind of boring. That there's not much in there. You'd probably be okay if you skipped it. But to Jesus, and now hopefully to me and to all of us who would follow Jesus... Leviticus is a revelation of our loving and our neighborly God. So we can get rid of this story. This story that pits the Old Testament against the New. We know that God is so much more complex than that. There's not a single story here. There's not a single story anywhere in the Bible, I would say. There are many stories about Nicodemus, and I think also there are many stories about the God he encounters through this kind of halting and still faithful discipleship. Let's think about this language of being born again. It's so commonly spoke of, not just in the church, oh sorry, not just in the church, but in all of popular culture. Jesus tells Nicodemus, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born again. What's born of flesh is born of flesh. What's born of spirit is born of spirit. Don't be astonished when I say to you, you must be born from above. I know I've heard this passage so many times without having any sense myself that it might be drawing on the actual experience of birth. When we remember that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life, we're called to remember also that we're born of God's, spi God's spirit. And to think of all the stories that this could express. Does it mean that God waits in loving and hopeful expectation for us? Does it mean that God feels our growth and our movements and our being as intimately as a pregnant mother? Does God labor in pain to give us birth? And do we bear the image of our God of whom we're spiritually born? These stories about Nicodemus, about our birthing God, are new to me. And they've allowed me to expand my story about what God is like and about what I might be like as a disciple of God. It's allowed me to be the kind of disciple who, like Nicodemus, might be scared. 
a disciple who's still learning, still learning how to speak up and to show up and not having perfected it yet. A disciple who maybe doesn't understand things the first time, or honestly, listening to myself now, maybe just isn't listening very well, but doesn't stop asking questions. A disciple who might not seem very faithful, but shows up again and again in the most unexpected places. I think these stories allow us to think, are there stories that we need to give up about our own lives. Maybe we need to end some stories. We need to end the story that we're just not good enough to be a disciple. End the story that tells us that we're unloved, that we're unwanted. End the story that tells us I don't look the way I want to, I'm a failure. The story that says I can't seem to achieve the accomplishments in my career that I want to achieve, I guess I'm just a mistake. And the story that says, well, by this point in my life, I should have had the right degree. I should have a job I love. I should have a certain kind of relationship, a certain kind of family. I should have all these things, but I just can't seem to get it right. Because how can that be the story that we tell about ourselves when here we read and we know that God so loved the whole world, even each and every one of us. That God loved us just the way we are and chose to send his only son to live among us, to be among us, even to die in our place that we might live forever with God. The story that tells us God loves us the way that we are, that God is seeking our salvation and choosing to love us eternally. After all, Jesus says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. There's no story of yours that doesn't have a home in God's story of salvation. There's no story of our life that can make us not enough or not worthy of finding ourselves in the story of God's saving love for the whole world. In a few moments, we're going to tell another story. It's the story of Jesus' last supper with his disciples, the story of his sacrifice, the story of his betrayal and death, the story of his saving work, and of our participation in his life and in his death. It's the story of how Jesus remains intimately in intimate communion with all of us throughout the whole world. And it's the story of how Jesus promises to be with us, as close to us as the bread that we eat and as real to us as the cup that we bless. It's a story that's been told more times than could ever be counted, but it's a story that gives birth to more stories as we meet God here at this table. So whether you come today confident and joyful, or if you come anxious and hesitant, or angry or exhausted or despairing, no matter how you come today, may you come and at this table, may you meet a God who came into the world to love you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, bless us this week as we go out to proclaim your gospel of love to the world around us. And bless us as we prepare and receive and rejoice in your holy meal shared among all of us here. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. According to the Gospel of Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is God's table, and our Savior invites those who trust in him to receive the feast that he's prepared. 
Before we do, will you pray with me again as we ready ourselves to participate in communion? Holy God, we joyfully give thanks to you at all times and in all places. O oh God, our creator, our mighty and everlasting Lord, you created the heaven with all its hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You've given us life and being and preserved us by your providence, but you have shown us the fullness of your love by sending into the world your child, Jesus Christ, eternal word made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior who's reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O God. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion in the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of faith and grow up in all things in Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf and these grapes from many hills into one cup, Grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Friends, the story goes that on the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples and told them, Eat, eat this, all of you. This is the new covenant in my blood. In the same way after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it, saying, take and drink. This cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. At this time, you'll receive the elements of communion in your seats. You're invited to hold them as we'll participate together when everyone has been served. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Receive them in faith and be built up in your faith. God, we are so grateful that you meet us wherever we are in our life, that we can find you in something as small as a piece of bread, 
and that we can find you when we need you the most. God, we pray that you send us out from this place encouraged and strengthened, that you let us feel you this close to us every day. All this we pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to respond with a song. The title is called Remembrance. So I'll give you a moment to look that up. Remembrance Hillsong.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be yours this day and every day. Go in peace. a quick announcement okay so we have numbers on the name tags we're going to try this again so as you are able uh sit at the table with the number on your name tag also if we could just leave this middle aisle open just for about 10 minutes while the praise team moves the stuff into the supply closet okay oh jeremy has another announcement Oh, the other thing is we're going to bring the food to you, so it's full serve. So just find your table number and sit down, and we'll bring the food to you. Great. Thank you.